This is the third video of the transistor series, and this time we'll talk about the problems that quantum physics generates in our electronic devices. In the previous episodes we saw how the most common transistors work, and how they manage to perform two essential functions, acting as switches of signals, and acting as signal amplifiers. And what is more important, without needing any moving parts? By taking all these characteristics and mixing them in complex circuits it becomes possible to build the processors that we use every day. In fact, when people say that computers use binary language to communicate, meaning that they use ones and zeros to describe any information that someone might want to transmit, it actually means that somewhere in the processor there is a transistor acting as a switch where the state in which no current passes is equal to zero, while when it passes it's equal to one. The total amount of changes in state between zero and one that a processor can perform per unit of time is directly related to the amount of information that they can transmit. In other words, the more, the better. And to achieve these improvements there are mainly two options. The first one is to increase the amount of state changes that a transistor can carry out independently which has effectively increased over the years. But around 2005 this frequency of operations began to stagnate, mainly because each state change requires energy, part of which is dissipated as heat. It reached a point where it was not practical to increase the frequency of a processor. At least for ordinary people. A clear example of this is what happens when a computer is overclocked. The frequency at which it works normally is increased to obtain better performance, but in return it requires more power and a heat sink that is capable of dissipate a greater amount of heat than the ones we find in a normal computer. The second option we have to improve the capacity of a processor is to increase the number of transistors that work together. This last way of improvement may seem easier, but it generates several related problems. First of all, the design of the connections between the transistors becomes more and more complex to be able to control them precisely and perform the desired tasks. Second of all, using more transistors also means that more physical space is required to contain them. And finally, the more transistors are used, more current will pass through the processor, generating heat in the process which, if not dissipated correctly, can melt the materials that compose it, leaving the processor completely unusable. Given these last two problems, the solution that has been applied over the past decades has been to reduce the size of transistors. In fact, the companies related to the development of processors focused so much on this optimization that the co-founder of Intel, Gordon Moore, stated in 1965 that the number of transistors per unit of surface in integrated circuits was doubling every year. This trend was proved for several years which is why it became known as Moore's Law. Although little by little the speed with which the number of transistors per unit of surface was doubling started to decrease, mainly due to the fact that more and more manufacturing processes were required. There are sophisticated technologies with the ability to precisely position atoms. You heard well, individual atoms. In fact, in 2013, IBM released a short film called The Boy and His Atom, where each point was indeed an iron atom. Although having the ability to do this in a laboratory doesn't necessarily mean that it is viable for mass production. But let's not drift away from the topic. Let's imagine a MOSFET transistor like the one we saw in the previous video. The way they worked was by means of a positively or negatively doped semiconductor channel which at each end changed the type of doping with which it was impossible for the current to pass through it, because in the union of these. Two types of semiconductors, a depletion or junction region was generated where there were no free electrons that allowed the flow of current. One of the ends was known as a source and the other as a drain. To this combination was also added a dielectric and an electrode or gate which, when applying a voltage, forced the electrons of the channel to move towards the edges, reducing the depletion region and therefore allowing the passage of current. The operation is simple. If the gate is activated the transistor lets the current pass between the source and the drain. If it is not activated, no current passes. Another way of visualizing its operation is by drawing an analogy with a water slide. 
where the height of the slide at each point corresponds to its potential. We know that there is a potential difference between the source and the drain, so the electrons will tend to move if the gate allows them. But when the gate is deactivated, the shape of the slide changes by adding a mound or potential barrier preventing the electrons from moving freely. Up until here everything continues to work as we saw in the previous episodes, but when we continue with Moore's law, decreasing more and more the size of the transistors the distance of the channel between the source and the drain has become only a few nanometers long, that is, a distance so small that it equals to a few dozens of aligned atoms. And when we reach such short distances, strange things begin to happen. We begin to enter in the world of quantum phenomena. So far we had represented the electrons that generate the electric current as particles which we knew exactly where they were located, but this was just a simplification. Even the well-known atomic model with protons and neutrons in the nucleus and electrons rotating in perfectly defined orbitals is not entirely correct either. The latest research made, and by latest I mean research made almost 100 years ago suggests that the position of the electrons with respect of the atom are defined in a probabilistic way, that is, depending on the type of atom, its energy. Among other things, there were areas in which it will be more likely to find an electron and others in which it will be less likely, but not impossible. Understanding this, if we return to our MOSFET transistor, which is extremely small, we will find that, from time to time, even when the gate is not activated, the current is able to cross between the source and the drain. If we go back to our slide model, it would be something like this. It seems as if the electrons used a shortcut and simply crossed the barrier that we had put. The transistor should completely prevent the passage of the current, but the electrons, that are subatomic particles, still manage to pass. This phenomenon is known as quantum tunneling, and it occurs because there is a small probability that the electron of an atom appears on the other side of the potential barrier and continues its path freely. This electron leakage in the transistor has two major implications. The first one is that the state of the transistor that previously corresponded to a zero is no longer perfect, because there is a small current that is managing to pass although at the moment this is not a big problem since as long as the value of the current equivalent to a zero and the equivalent to a one is different enough, it will be possible to transmit information. The second implication, and perhaps the most problematic one, is that if current is passing through the circuits at all times then again we will find that additional heat will be generated in the processor. But this does not end here. The smaller the distance is, the most likely will be that the phenomenon of quantum tunneling occurs, it will be more difficult to discern between the value of zero and one and more heat will be generated in the processor. Basically we're in a point at which is not viable to continue decreasing the size of the transistor, and in fact this point has already been reached several years ago, at least for the MOSFET. But all is not lost, because when faced with this dilemma, scientists began to research and develop a new transistor specifically made to reduce the probability of the quantum tunneling phenomenon occurring. This transistor is known as FinFET. Several years of research have passed since this new type of transistor was proposed until they finally managed to reduce its manufacturing costs, and in 2011, Intel introduced them in its line of processors. One of the revolutionary elements of this type of processor, and the reason why it cost so much to develop them, is that their operation depended on a three-dimensional shape and not on a series of superimposed layers like the MOSFET. The name FinFET comes from its fin-like shape and the abbreviation of Field Effect Transistor. In fact, its operation is quite similar to that of MOSFET transistors. To understand how it works, we are adding the components one by one. The first of them is a block with three layers of material, the silicon substrate, that is, the basic material on which everything will be built, an oxide layer that acts as a separator, and another doped silicon layer that will end up being the channel through which the electrons will pass. To this last layer, we remove a little material, and we will be left with a silicon fin. At this point, if we connect two electrodes at each end, the current could pass without problems. But if we add an oxide layer in the middle of the fin, and then an electrode, which by the way corresponds to the gate we can apply a voltage to that electrode to control the behavior of the electrons that pass through the channel at our will, 
In other words, we will have the ability to make the entire section of the fin covered by the gate become the depletion region, completely preventing the passage of current. If we compare the effect of the gate in a MOSFET versus what happens in a FIN-FED, we will realize that in the first case only one face of the channel is being controlled while in the FIN-FET three sides are being controlled at the same time, this being the secret of its effectiveness, since the potential barrier generated is much greater and therefore the probability that the electrons pass is decreased. It works, yes, but if we keep reducing the sizes every time we will find this phenomenon again, and all the problems that it entails. So, unfortunately, the FinFET is not the definitive solution. In fact, other options are already being developed, such as the gaffet or gate all-around field effects transistor that basically takes an extra step and instead of controlling three sides of the channel through the gate, it controls all sides, generating nanowires that allow us to better control the flow of current, but unfortunately at some point we will find ourselves with the same problem, Physics quantum will again complicate our lives, but to be fair, the truth is that the phenomena of quantum physics can also be used in our favor if we can control them. But we will see that in the next episode.